This is Earth Files, the award-winning news site with the latest updates in science, environment, and real X-Files. Podcasting in-depth reports beyond the 6 o'clock news by Emmy Award-winning journalist Linda Moulton Howe. If you could fly near the surface of the sun, there would be a lot of humming and sonic booms. At Stanford University and the University of California, Berkeley, physicists have processed radio signals from the sun and produced audio files. The sun vibrates with a hum that goes up and down every five minutes. Stanford scientists call it the singing sun. Stanford University solar physicists also provided several decades of sunspot data to Jim Metzner, producer of radio's Pulse of the Planet. After the radio signal data was processed into audio files and the years were speeded up, it sounds like a heartbeat. Spots on the sun were not seen by humans through telescopes until 1610. Two years later, in 1612, the great Italian physicist and astronomer Galileo sketched for publication mysterious dark regions that he saw on the sun. Today, 400 years later, we call those dark regions sunspots. Sunspots emerge periodically on the sun's surface with more intense magnetic fields than the rest of the sun. At those spots, which can be much larger than Earth, those strong magnetic anomalies slow down the sun's convection current, which normally stirs hot gas from deep inside the sun up to the surface. At spots where the convection current has slowed or stopped, the sun's surface temperature can drop 2 to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Cooler temperature means no glowing gas in those spots, which is why their color turns so dark. Sunspots are also the origin of the dramatic flares known as coronal mass ejections. Big flares propel a solar wind of ionized particles or plasmas into the solar system at speeds of 2 million miles an hour or more. Strong magnetic storms can hurt astronauts in space and damage satellites. Solar storms can overwhelm and damage our electric power grids and other electromagnetic equipment on Earth and interfere with airplanes over the poles and transmissions in radio and television. The ionized gases from strong storms on the sun also collide with ionospheric gases in our polar atmospheres, which then glow in beautiful greens, reds, blues, and violets. That's the aurora borealis, or northern lights. Despite four centuries of study from old telescopes to modern satellites, solar physicists still do not know the details of how sunspots work or even why there are solar cycles. Right now, at the beginning of 2007, this should be the very bottom or minimum of the current solar cycle numbered 23. The solar minimum is when the sun should be most calm without sunspots. But in December 2006, between the 5th and the 14th, a large sunspot called 930 unleashed a series of powerful X-class flares, the strongest class of sunstorms. Throughout this 23rd solar cycle, there have been surprisingly strong bursts of X-flares. One was so strong in the last solar maximum that it went off the charts, and scientists dubbed it the biggest solar X-ray flare on record at least X-20. That historic X-20 flare erupted on April 2, 2001. That solar wind roared into space at nearly 5 million miles an hour. The Earth was lucky that day because that coronal mass ejection missed our planet, 
If it had hit us directly, power grids and satellites would probably have been damaged. Recently, on December 21, 2006, NASA issued a news release entitled, Scientists Predict Big Solar Cycle. The lead paragraph said, quote, Solar Cycle 24 looks like it's going to be one of the most intense cycles since record-keeping began almost 400 years ago, unquote. So I called up Dr. David Hathaway, solar physics team leader at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, and asked him if Solar Cycle 24 has started yet and why it's expected to be so strong. I was surprised to learn that despite the NASA headline, the sun is giving off mixed signals that are confounding astrophysicists in their predictions. We haven't seen the official first spot of the new cycle, but we've seen indications that new cycle spots are getting ready to form. And one that looked like there was a spot, but appeared while it was on the back side of the sun, the far side of the sun. And by the time it rotated around our side, the spot had disappeared, but its magnetic remains were still there. So it, it does look like the new cycle is starting, but we're still waiting to see the first spot that's unquestionably the spot for the new cycle. And how will you know? What do you look for? Two things we look for. One is the magnetic polarity. The magnetic polarities of sunspots flip from one cycle to the next and from one hemisphere to the other. And so uh, we should see that the magnetic polarities are, are flipped north to south and south to north. But we've already seen some of those. The other key ingredient is it needs to be a spot at a fairly high latitude, usually above 25 degrees. Sometimes there are first spots of the new cycle that appear as low as 20 degrees or so. But uh, all of the reverse polarity spots we've seen thus far have been low latitude. And what do you expect, based on historic data, for how this solar maximum will unfold? Uh, it's a little confusing this time around, actually. Uh, we haven't had this problem in the past, but there are a number of indicators that we can look at related to sunspots and solar activity that give us an idea ahead of time of how big the cycle is going to be. And things that have worked and agreed in the past don't agree this time. One thing we look at is geomagnetic activity. This is shaking of the Earth's magnetic field, which is caused by two different things on the sun. One is flaring activity and what we call coronal mass ejections, these huge clouds of material that are blasted off of the sun at more than a million miles an hour. As they travel through the solar system and hit the Earth, they actually are stopped by our magnetic field, and it shakes our magnetic field, and we can see that on the ground. We've seen those variations in the Earth's magnetic field for over 150 years now. Another source of that is high-speed wind coming off of the sun. What we found in the past is that the level of that activity one or two years before the minimum of the cycle is a good indicator of how big the next cycle is going to be. It's as if the sun is already you know, building up its magnetic fields and starting to let loose early on, and that activity says the next cycle is going to be big. But another thing we look at is how strong the magnetic fields are at the poles of the sun. And this time around, and we've only been able to do that for the last 30 years or so, so we only have three cycles of that. But those fields have been very weak this time. They're weak now, and that suggests that the next cycle is going to be small. The one new tool we have this time around is that we now have models, much like what meteorologists have for predicting weather on the Earth. We now have models for how the sun does this, how it makes magnetic fields, makes sunspots in the sunspot cycle, and those models are telling us that the next cycle is going to be big. So we've got a bit of a problem this time in trying to sort out why, in particular, the magnetic fields at the poles are saying small, while other things are saying that it's going to be a big cycle. And we need to sort that out as scientists here within the next few months, hopefully, before this cycle gets started, because there are people that really need to know how big this next cycle is going to be. Thanks for listening to this Earth Files podcast from the edges of science, environment, and real X-Files. Go to www.earthfiles.com to see more than a thousand Earth Files reports with photographs, drawings, and documents. And visit Earth Files every day, every week, for new reports and new podcasts. That's www.earthfiles.com. 